Thanks for being here, Jan. I am so excited for this conversation. Many have probably read a lot about California Forever, and we're going to get into the specifics of it. A city between Sacramento and San Francisco, 60,000 acres. But I want to start with you, because you actually have a very fascinating story. You grew up far away from California in a small working class town in the Czech Republic. And I want to understand, what was it in your childhood growing up that led you to say, I want to move to America and build a city? Um, it's, it's great to be here, thank you. Uh, and it's great to get to tell the story. We've been working on this for seven years quietly, and so it's, it's nice to be able to tell it. Um, I was born in 1987 in the Czech Republic. Um, Czech, the, the Velvet Revolution happened in 89. The Berlin Wall came down in 1990. Um, the Soviet Empire fell in 91, and so it was a, it was a very special time. And um, I think there were two influences. Um, there was a, I mean, from a cultural perspective, um, I grew up on a, um, on a diet of Hollywood culture and movies and TV shows. And the 90s was an incredibly optimistic time in America. I mean, I think it was probably the most optimistic time uh, in, in, in a long time in America. And uh, I kind of soaked that all in. And I think that um, there is something about the culture that you consume during your kind of I guess teenage years in particular, um, that just gets buried in your, in your brain. And uh, we know that about music and that there's kind of other things where that happens. And so to me, America was this place of idealism and opportunity, and, and California was this deeply optimistic place. Um, and um, and uh, so it was amazing after, after, I don't know, 17 years uh, later to be able to come here. Um, and uh, um, partially, it also drives how I think about some of the negativity that we've seen in, in California and the Bay Area about our inability to build things or our inability to solve some of the challenges where I still have that, that vision that I had 20 years ago. And so it, it makes me upset and it makes me want to work on building it and making it better. Yeah, and we, we back a lot of immigrant founders usually building companies, not cities. So it's extraordinary that you're, you're biting off an even bigger project. But we've alluded to it. California Forever, many have probably read about it. What exactly is California Forever in your words, and why are you building it now? Um, California Forever is an attempt to um, make sure that the Bay Area remains the center of innovation and prosperity that it's been for the last 50 years. Um, and we're, we're doing that by building a new city, the first new major city in the Bay Area um, that is that has been proposed or built um, in the last probably 50 years. And so we're proposing to do that halfway between San Francisco and um, Sacramento uh, in a place called Solano County on the California Delta. And um, uh, we've purchased about 60,000 acres in that area. We're proposing to build a dynamic, walkable community on a portion of that property um, and then surround it with um, open space and renewable energy, both, both wind and solar. Um, and um, um, why am I working on it now? Um, I think a lot of it, um, some of it goes back to um, kind of how I got to the Bay about 10 years ago. So I got to the Bay 10 years ago, and um, you mentioned it before, I grew up in a very blue collar family in the Czech Republic, in a very rural part of the Czech Republic. Um, and when I say blue collar, I mean uh, my grandmother built the house that I grew up in with her bare hands. She did the masonry work, she did the, the, the roof beams, she did the, um, she did the plumbing work, she, she painted the walls. Um, and my dad, um, my dad was a car mechanic who um, built some of the early radio communications infrastructure in the Czech Republic. And so he built the radio towers. Um, and uh, when I go back to see my parents now um, and I make a phone call on my cell phone, the, the signal still goes through the tower that my dad built in the, in the area, which is a 1,200 foot structure that they finished building in the 70s or in the 80s. Um, and uh, they finished the building in December, in like minus 30 degree um, temperatures. There's wind kind of swaying the whole structure. And so I think that growing up there gave me a deep appreciation for um, the value of kind of skilled craft, crafts and cr kind of skilled labor and the fact that the world around us is, is built by us. It's kind of not something that we just accept. And the contrast to me with coming to the Bay is that um, I go to the Bay about 10 years ago and um, I think that this, this combination of capital and creativity and 
culture and talent that exists in the Bay Area and has for the last 50 years. Um, I think once you've lived there for a while or if you're born there, it's easy to forget how just special and rare that is. Um, I've since then started to think that um, I think what's happened in the Bay Area has happened maybe seven times in the history of the modern world, at least in the West. I think it happened in Florence and Paris and London and New York and Chicago and maybe LA. And then it happened in the Bay Area. And when I moved there, I loved it for all of the reasons that, that, that I just named and for the reasons that everyone loves it and the cultural openness and the, and the beauty of the place. But um, it was a time when housing costs were beginning to escalate in the Bay Area. Yeah. And in a, in a crazy way. And um, I think what people began to realize at the time is that the Bay was, the Bay Area was possibly on the verge of becoming the greatest squandering of economic opportunity in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that lightly, but we had the situation where we had a innovation engine that was spitting out these wonderful new products and services that made life better for Americans and for everyone around the world. And we were creating good paying jobs that everyone around the world was dreaming of and trying to attract. And all we had to do in the Bay was just build more homes, something that we've known for 10,000 years how to do. And um, because we didn't do that, even the communities in the Bay Area were beginning to completely break in terms of social fabric. This is the time when you had people throwing rocks at Google buses. Mm -hmm. Because instead of, because we didn't build enough housing, we had created a zero-sum tournament where people were forced to fight with each other over the same stock of housing in the Bay Area. And so instead of people celebrating that we had new employers and new jobs coming to the Bay, um, the communities by fighting over it, which is insane. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've kind of accepted that that's insane. Like the whole world is trying to be you and you kind of killing the, killing the ecosystem. And, um, and you could see that in the numbers. I mean, if, if I told you that we have an area in the country that's producing all of this innovation and high paying jobs, would you expect people to be moving in or to be moving out? Yeah. You'd expect people to be moving in, right? Because it's creating opportunities. And that's what happened for 60 years in California. It was the place that people from the rest of the country moved to, to realize the California dream. And in, for the last 10 years, people have been moving out of California. Yeah. More Americans move out of California every year than move in. And it's not because they don't want to be there. It's because we've made it impossible to live there. Yeah. Um, and even at a national level, um, um, there's now a body of well-established economic research that basically says that our inability to build enough housing in the Bay Area and in New York and a couple of other places is reducing the Amer GDP across America, not just in those areas, by significant numbers. I mean, there was a famous paper in, I think, 2015 that C and Enrico Moretti out of Berkeley published where they argued quite convincingly that if we built enough housing in the Bay, in New York, and a couple of other places, American GDP would be higher by 14% or more. Wow. Not, not in those areas, across America. So American GDP is, what, $27 trillion now? And so 14% of that is $4 trillion of economic output yeah. um, every year. So not, one, a, not, not one of. So it's a housing question, but when you're trying to get people to move to a new city, you also have to think about the, the other part of the equation, which is jobs, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. What is your pitch to employers to say, <laughs> you know, either leave San Francisco or, or come? Like, what, what is the pitch that you are going to tell them to come to Solano County? Um, so we have a lot of employers in the room, I think, in the Bay Area and in New York and D.C. Um, how many people feel like they need to... Um, pay their employees increasingly more and more and more because their employees can't afford to live in the cities that they want to live in? Probably a lot of you. How many of you are struggling because you can't get your employees to come to the office every day? Um, because your employees have a commute that's 45 minutes, or in some cases, one and a half hour, and they just don't want to spend that amount of time in traffic every day. So even though when you tell them that they, they should come to the office, they fight, and they don't want to because they want to see their kids, and they want, to, they want to have breakfast with their kids. They want to have dinner with their kids. And so our pitch is, imagine, imagine that you had a place like, um, West Village in New York, or Georgetown in DC, or Noe Valley or the Marina in San Francisco. Medium density, row houses, backyards, traditional American urbanism, local shopping streets where you can walk to. Then imagine that we improved the transportation system by creating super blocks 
um, where cars inside those superblocks can only go about 10 miles an hour. We created biking and public transport infrastructure to use with that, meaning your kids can actually play in the streets, meaning your kids can actually walk to school alone and you don't have to be chauffeur your whole life like a crazy person. <laughs> um, um, and then imagine that we build that in a place that is 25 minutes to Napa Valley and that is an hour and a half away from Tahoe. And so it's a lot closer to those places that everyone in the Bay Area loves than Palo Alto or Cupertino or San Francisco or Oakland. And then imagine that that place is still an hour and a half away from your headquarters or office in San Francisco or Palo Alto or Menlo Park or wherever. And so if, you, if your team members between the two offices want to go and see each other, you don't have to do um, Uber, TSA, airport, plane, delayed plane, airport, Uber, get to the office in Austin or Denver or wherever it is, but you can actually get in a car and in an hour and a half or in an hour you can be there. And then imagine that it was a city for up to 400,000 people that was entitled and approved at once. And so you knew that for the next, um, you knew that for the next 30 years, if this office is going to work and you'll be able to hire talent there, there'll be enough space for you to grow in for the next 30 years. Yep. There'll be enough office and there'll be enough homes for your employees, whether they want to rent them or whether they want to buy them. And then imagine that instead of paying um, four or five million dollars for a mediocre home in Palo Alto or San Francisco, your employees would be able to buy a nice house for a million dollars. Yeah, I think that's where everyone says sign me up. <laughs> um, but another unique facet of this project actually that I think a lot of people in this room will be very interested in is that it's located very close to Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Um, and the area is home to many veterans. So how do you envision the interaction between this new city and the veteran community that's populous there? Um, we, we think that Solano County has the opportunity to um, become, go to the roots of what Silicon Valley used to be. Yeah. And so Silicon Valley started with defense, we all know this. Um, I learned the other day that between 1950 and 1980, the largest employer in Silicon Valley was Lockheed Martin. Um, and so that's not that far back. And, but then we lost, the, we lost the defense business because land costs became too big, became, became too high. There wasn't enough land for manufacturing. Um, and um, it became too expensive to do. And then there were cultural issues with the fights between the tech sector and the defense industry. And we think that, particularly with American dynamism and this revival in interest in um, investing in defense innovation, there's a real opportunity to bring some of that back to Northern California. Um, and it's hard to do that in the, in, in the core Bay Area for all of the reasons that we discussed. Um, but in Solano County, there's an opportunity where there is an existing large labor force. There's, there's, there's um, Travis is there. Mare Island used to be there, which was a naval base. And so there's a lot of cultural heritage and, and history of that. And so we think that Solano County can become the, the, the foundry of American defense innovation for the next 50 years. And um, I think that there was a lot of talk today about our adversaries and some of the challenges with that. And I think th there were two things that I think would have given our adversaries hope over the last um, 15 years, if you want, um, in what's going to slow down the pace of innovation in America. And number one, it was the fact that we were strangling the um, Bay Area innovation ecosystem by just not providing enough housing, so we couldn't create the critical mass. We couldn't innovate as quickly as we could otherwise. And then the second was this um, period of, I would say, limited engagement between the defense community and, and at least some of the venture firms in the Valley and, and how that worked. And I think our project has, a, has an opportunity to be a, a, a nightmare for our enemies, where uh, uh, it is an opportunity for the leading venture capital investment funds and individuals in the Valley to come together with the military in a location that can accumulate growth for the next 30 years. Yeah. And so I think when people look back in 2050, they might say that this was one of the most interesting and lasting and um, impactful partnerships between um, um, the uh, the government and the military and Silicon Valley in the country. Yeah, so I want to ask, you know, building a new city, we've done it many times in America, yet there's a lot of skepticism around building a new city today. Why do you think that is? It's a good question. I, um, I think it's an idea that's fell out of fashion, and because of it, people don't quite know how to think about it. Um, um, but it, it is interesting. It's, it's completely acceptable in California 
and actually in most of the country today, to say that you're working on inventing artificial intelligence. But when you say that because homes in the Bay cost $5 million and nobody reasonable, nobody, no, 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 no everyday person can afford to live there, you want to take a bunch of um, non-prime farmland uh, that isn't ecologically sensitive and build some homes there so people can afford to live in the Bay Area, that's somehow controversial. It's okay to be building artificial intelligence and it's controversial to be building a new city. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. So assuming your initiative called the East Solano Homes Jobs and Clean Energy Initiative passes in November, what's the time frame for breaking ground and, and actually completing the project? Um, we, um, our target is to break ground in 2027. Um, that is ambitious by California standards. A couple of things have to happen for that to be the case. Um, but we're pretty optimistic that we would be able to do that. Um, in terms of completing it, um, uh, it's, it's a multi-decade project and that, that's, um, we've sized it. We, we are proving it all at once so that people have the visibility, so that employers have the visibility that this is going to be here. Um, and so um, I certainly hope to be building, working on it in, the, in, in 20 or 30 years. Um, um, someone told me if you're trying to start a new city, it helps to start young. And so I was 29 when we started, so we have a little bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and speaking of being young, you know, if, if you look at the you know, trajectory 50 years from now, say, what's the dream for this new city? What do you hope it looks like? What does it look like when it's fully developed? Um, I think we would, we would um, um, in what it looks like, it should look like a bustling, d dynamic community. Um, some of the best, something that actually someone from, that would resemble some of these most beloved neighborhoods in America that we have today. Some of them I already mentioned and we have more. Unfortunately, most of the, if I ask people in the room to name your favorite neighborhood in America, the odds are you would name a place that was built in the 1800s or early 1900s. I think Tyler Cohen is speaking later on today. I think he's been asking some of his guests, what's your favorite neighborhood and why can't we build amazing places anymore? And we, wanna, we want to rediscover the art of building great cities and neighborhoods. And um, that will be one of the contributions that we would make, which is rediscover how we can do that so that other cities can hopefully learn from that. Um, we will have hopefully created a place that makes life much better for people in Solano County, the ones there right now and the ones who move in. Um, the, it's a county where um, there's no major uh, private sector employers in the county, and so way too many of the residents commute an hour and a half, two hours every day for work, which means they never see their kids, and we can bring that economic engine. And then lastly, I think um, it's an opportunity to make sure that the Bay Area retains the, remains the center of innovation and prosperity that it has been for the last 70 years. I think um, it's, um, I would say it's fair to say that for the last 70 years, the modern world was invented in, uh, a lot of it was invented in, in the Bay Area and in California. And I think that's been amazing um, for the country overall. And it's not clear that that's gonna be the case for the next 70 years. And I think we would all much rather that the world is built and invented in, in, in America with American values than somewhere overseas. And I think that isn't going to happen if we don't create the room for us to innovate, particularly now that the Valley to the point of American dynamism is doing so much more in advanced manufacturing and defense and um, agriculture technologies and all of these sectors that touch the real world. And um, you can't invent them or they are very difficult to invent in Palo Alto when a home costs $5 million and you can't get any office space to build a factory or something like that or an R&D facility. And so um, hopefully we can uh, help make sure that uh, um, the future is what it should be. Yeah, and thank you for reigniting the California dream. Thank you.